his word. God, you are victorious. And, and, and you're not concerned about a possible alternative. There aren't these moments for you where you're like, man, this might not happen. Let's hope. You know, it just, you're just not it, so confident, so sovereign over all things. To have that power and knowledge and awareness and compassion and wisdom and then be for us? God, we can't lose. I ask for forgiveness particularly today just at how um, short-sighted I can be, how prone to despair I can be, to worry that I can be, And I just thank you for moments of bolstered faith, encouraged faith, spurred on faith, where I remember again who you are and what you've done and what you're doing. And I'm glad. I'm grateful. So God, meet us in this space. Jesus, would you lead your church? Holy Spirit, would you empower your church? indwell your church, anoint your church for the work. And would all of that result in the glory of God and a people thriving while they make your name known. It's big, it's glorious, and thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Those in agreement said, amen. Let's, let's talk about admittance. Um, we, 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 we get it in, in some sense. What it, when we say admit it, admittance, what is it? Um, well, simply defined, it's just the, the process or the fact of being admitted or entering into something. And, he, and this is key, I think, in the definition. Or being allowed to enter. So it's, it's not just the process of entering or the fact that you have entered. It's that you have been allowed to enter. And so the, the, when I think about admittance, that's what I'm thinking about this morning. And so that's not really lost on us. We're, we're in a culture. Uh, we, we get kind of the rhythm and the economy of admittance. There's all sorts of requirements to get into College, you have to have a high school diploma to get into grad school, a bachelor's degree, and a fancy restaurant, you need a reservation. And a, if you want to get into a bar, you got to be 21. If, a movie theater, you need to have a ticket. You need to have your hand stamped if you're going in and out of a stadium or an amusement park. You need, all these things, you want to drive on public roads, you need a driver's license. Like all of these things that allow you to either access or take advantage of something. And any more with everything that we've been just wrestling with socially, all these new requirements that we have upon entering. What does this space require? What does this next space require for admittance? And so the, the idea is not lost on us. The process of being allowed to enter, what's required? What do I need to either have with me or what do I need to do to have access? So we're going we're gonna to start in Acts chapter 15 and then we'll get back to uh, our study of the book of Ephesians. We've been working our way through that book if you're visiting with us. We'll start in Acts 15 and we'll move from there. The book of Acts is, if you're not familiar... The second part of a two-volume work. So you have the book of Acts, which is the second part. And the first part is what? The book of Luke. Luke wrote both of these and really with a similar aim. And so it very much, if you, if you read the book of Luke and then you read the book of Acts, there is this sense of continuation. And so some people, it's not two different works. Scholars see it as one work in two parts. And, and, and so that's what we have in, in 
So where the gospel of Luke is about, according to Acts chapter 1, where the gospel of Luke is about what Jesus began to do and teach, so the life and work of Jesus, Acts would then be what Jesus continued to do and teach, only now through his apostles, through his church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is poured out on them in Acts chapter 2. So I, I, I was thinking about it this week. So, so basically... The book of Acts is to the gospel of Luke what the Avengers is to Captain America. It's, it's that. Here is the work begins and then empowered and expanded. This is how the work continues. Just with more people involved. More people wielding power than just the one. And so that's the rhythm between those two books. And so the church is birthed in Acts chapter 2, and then in what follows, it begins to expand all over the face of the earth. Now, let's get the big picture. In the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what did God sort of command his created image bearers, mankind, what did he command them to do? To to be fruitful, to, to multiply, and to fill the earth. So this idea that the church is birthed and then commanded in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 to move out, to expand, is a continuation of what God originally told his people to do. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion over it. And and so then the Holy Spirit is given the church's birth and then it's really not all that different. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And that's the scope of the book of Acts as the church begins to expand and fill the earth. And it's not just geographic. It's not just a geographic expansion. And I think about missions in, the, in sort of the greater context in our day. It's not just geographic. When you cross geographic lines, you tend to also cross what? Ethnic and cultural lines. And so it's not just about the expansion of the church in this sort of homogenous sort of vision of the church. It is by assumption, by virtue of crossing geographical lines, but also it's, 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 it's explicit in Scripture when God says that he desires that all nations come to know him. Okay, so the expectation is that the church is birthed and moves out to fill the earth that it's going to engage cultures. And, and, and established churches, multi-ethnic churches, diverse churches as it expands. So it's not just geographic, it's, it's ethnic, it's cultural as well. That's the expectation. God always intended to be the God of a diverse, multicultural people. That has always been the intention, even as he selected his nation of Israel in the Old Testament, even though he singled out one nation. If you're familiar with the narrative of the Old Testament, you know that he singled out that nation in order to display his glory to all nations. So he picked a people that were going to be as numerous as the stars, so that his glory would be on display for all the families of the earth, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. So his intention was always, always diverse. Always multicultural. That was his vision. This harmony, even amidst diversity, enjoying and benefiting from what is um, sort of provided by that diversity. If you think about it, uh, we're, we're, we're different. We have different backgrounds, different cultures bring different sort of um, life and benefit to thriving and human flourishing. And all of that together in harmony builds the church up, doesn't it? Like we're not all the same. All the same with all the same gifts and all the same contributions. There's, so God always intended this diversity, and, and, and through, in and through that diversity, we would have the benefit of great harmony and gift for the building of the church and the glory of God. However, in sin, we sought supremacy over one another, deciding on homogeny or sameness 
to our own glory. Okay, I just I, I want, you to, want you to see that. In light of where we're going to be at the end of Ephesians chapter 2, this is sort of laying that groundwork. So where God intended for there to be this multicultural expression, this diverse expression, this harmony and oneness, and he would be their God, they would be his people, he would be glorified in and through that expression. Instead, we sought supremacy over one another. And rather than harmony, there is now a fight. So you, you look back in the Old Testament, and, and, and God said this, going all the way back to Genesis. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. So the people of God from the very beginning were meant to rule over all creation. Instead, in sin, you see that in Genesis 11 and then following, and we're experiencing it um, just dramatically as, uh, today as well, is instead of in harmony and in unity and in oneness, a diverse people sort of having dominion over all creation, we are now seeking to have dominion over one another. Rather than seeking to share that responsibility and mandate that God gave us to have dominion over all creation, we're now seeking to have the dominion over one another. And wars and genocide and racism and all of these things are a result. So we recognize that as God gifts the church, the Holy Spirit births the church, that we, we need to understand that our mandate as his people his family, his kingdom is tied all the way back to our very creation that we would in unity, together and diverse with many expressions in oneness, subdue creation to the glory of God and establish his kingdom instead of all of our own mini kingdoms that we're just fighting back and forth trying to conquer one another. That's national, certainly, and international, certainly, but it's individual, too. We're trying to outpace neighbors and coworkers and having dominion and supremacy over them. That, okay, that's the twisted, twisted mandate of God. You see that? Okay, so, Acts 15 as the church was expanding geographically and now ethnically, was having to figure out a new way to do church. Because God's identified people, the Jews, he chose them as his particular people to put on display the glory of God for all creation. Instead, they sought supremacy for themselves and they, they sought homogeny with themselves and, and turned in and ex to the exclusion of others, not to the display of God's glory to the nations of bless the other families of the earth, Genesis chapter 12, but to just seek their own supremacy and their own glory. And so the church's birth, the church begins to expand over the whole earth, which is God's original intention, And now they got to figure out how to do it. How to do church with all of the differences. If the church is not about sameness, but oneness, then what has to change? I think that's a question the church needs to keep asking itself within its own context and community. If it's not about sameness, and it's not... <laughs> It's about oneness, even when there isn't sameness, where we're different and diverse and have different stories and backgrounds and ethnicities and cultures. It's, it's, so how do we then do church when, when we're so different in, the, in that way? That's Acts 15. That's Acts 15. So... Last couple of chapters, you have Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch in Syria, and they've been identified by the Holy Spirit as missionaries, and they're sent out to preach all over Asia Minor. And if you're familiar with the three missionary journeys, they just get wider and wider and wider as they go until he finds himself in prison and ultimately in Rome. So many churches were planted, and so many non-Jews were coming to Christ. By the time you get to Acts 8... You're starting to see that this is not just a revival amongst the Jews. The Samaritans are coming in. 
These are kind of sort of these, these half Jewish kind of these uh, melting pot kind of culture. They have Jewish heritage, but they're, they're not pure blood anymore. And so they're kind of on the outs. And they have their own temple and their own place of worship. You have the Jews and they're, suprem- they're fighting for supremacy, which is the right temple we're supposed to wor- worship in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. So again, it's that battle against one another and Samaritans are starting to come to Christ. And then by 10, chapter 10, Gentiles without any Jewish heritage at all are coming to Christ. People have different places of worship, different backgrounds, all of these things coming together. So Paul comes back and he's going to report, man, so many non-Jews, so many Gentiles are coming to Christ. We planted churches. We're seeing all this stuff happen. It's awesome. Look at... um, We'll start in chapter 14, verse 24. So this is the close of their first missionary journey. And they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when he had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Antalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. That takes us back to Acts 13. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. And how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained there no little time with the disciples. Now Acts 15. But. Uh Uh-oh. But. Look what happened. But some men came down from Judea. And were teaching the brothers. Unless you were circumcised. According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, this, this is not the last time this issue is going to come up, not just in Scripture, but in the church. This comes up again and again and again. This, what must we do to gain admittance? What must I have with me? What is it that I've got to do? What boxes do I need to check? What do I have to do? And various expressions and various religions have all sorts of different lists. To what? To gain admittance. And that's what we have here in Acts 15. So yay, people are coming to God, yay, and this sort of feigned excitement that's quickly turned to yeah, 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 fine, that's great, but... This is how you need. Oh, and by the way, our culture is supreme, so you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. Culturally, we've seen that in international mission work. It's not just about taking the gospel to other cultures. Oftentimes, Western culture goes too, doesn't it? Western culture goes too, and this is how you should dress, and this is how you should order yourself when you're gathered, and this is, that's Western. So it's more than the gospel going forward. It's a dominant culture. And the dominant culture never sees it. Why? Oh, because they're the dominant culture. This is the way we do it. Well, that's the way the dominant culture does it. And we add to things required for admittance. Okay, church wars. If you've been around the church for any length of time, church wars, this is what church wars are. And typically, very rarely... Are they about theological, doctrinal things where we're talking about these essential matters? It, it tends to be on whether or not we're going to keep the pews. You know how many times I've had people ask if we're going to keep the pews? You might like them, but who cares? Right? Like so many churches have added to and culture becomes the primary thing we're, we're sort of transmitting, not the gospel. And then war ends up happening in and around culture. Look at, guys, just look at our social landscape right now. We have lost, a friend of mine put it so well the other day, the middle has collapsed in these conversations. Can we identify that there has been oppression and racism in our country? Can we identify and be honest about that? That there are systemic even issues in our country without sort of linking arms with the other side that would only seek to now just establish a new supreme culture. This is not about, like, the answer to um, white supremacy is not black supremacy. 
We've lost the middle ground. Like God's desire is for, for oneness amidst diversity. And yet, we engage in these, these um, sort of opposite sides of the river, if you will, if the middle has collapsed and we're just lobbing these things and, and being at war with one another to establish our own cultural dominance, which is the twisted creation mandate. Are you guys tracking with me? Okay? Okay. We got to get this in the picture of what God intended to do if we're to order ourselves according to the way that he designed the church to function. It will radically affect how we see the mission of God. And when we send out church planters and when we send out missionaries, what is it we're sending them? What is it that we are sending out? What's the message that is going out These things affect those things. And we have to be aware of that. The Jews had a long heritage of living according to the law. And I think we can understand that. I think we can understand that and be honest about it. I get that. I get what it's like to have a long-standing tradition and a preference built around that tradition. So I can understand that. I can sympathize with that. I can appreciate that. They have Moses, they have Mount Sinai, they have the Ten Commandments, the the whole deal. God entered into this covenant with his people, and the law of Moses were the terms. So God is saying with his people, when he initially engages with Abraham, is this idea, if you are going to continue as my people, and you see this repeated um, up through Moses, you see it repeated in the Kings, you see it repeated during the prophetic, if you are going to continue to be my people, here are the terms. You violate the terms and judgment. Doesn't that also go back to the garden? It does. So keep this in the big picture. You're going to be my people. These are the terms. You violate the terms and there is judgment. That's nothing new. Okay. So it was ingrained in them and we can appreciate that. And so Jesus comes along and he specifically in Matthew 5, 17 says, I did not come to abolish the law, Remember, he's speaking predominantly to Jews at this point. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to what? What? Fulfill it. So let's be, let's be clear. This is a continuation. This isn't, this isn't something that has been abolished. This is something that has come to completion. It's, being, it's been fulfilled in Christ. So Jesus fulfills the old covenant and then enters into or establishes, Jeremiah 31, we knew it was coming, a new covenant, this covenant in his blood, he says in 1 Corinthians. This covenant now is in my blood. Where the covenant before, if you remember all the sacrifices, there was, there was lots of blood. This, this covenant's in his blood. Now why in his blood? The sacrificial system teases it out. Hebrews 9 says, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So this rhythm in the Old Testament of sacrificing animals all the time and shedding blood was on behalf of sins to make atonement. But Hebrews talks about the fact that the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient, doesn't work. So we understand from Hebrews that the, the, the regular sacrificing of animals in the Old Covenant was not, act, it didn't actually work. It was a picture of what would one day come that would work. That's why they had to do it all the time. That's one of the arguments in Hebrews is, why did they have to do that all the time? Because it didn't work. If it worked, you'd do it once, and it'd be done. So the the repetition almost was meant to also ingrain in them the insufficiency of the blood of bulls and goats. So that when Christ, the Messiah, would step into humanity and come and die on the behalf of all the sins and all the world, and we would see that he would die once for all. That's, that's what Scripture says. Once for all. Makes that emphatic. Jesus doesn't need to keep dying over and over again. He did it once. It was efficacious. It worked. So he's done. Now he's seated. We've talked about that. That's the new covenant in his blood. He died to atone for sins, and his blood worked. The other blood was just a picture of the blood that would one day come and work. This blood didn't work, but it, it, it pointed forward to a blood that would. And so Jesus comes, and he doesn't come to abolish it, but to what? 
fulfill it. So everything in the law and the prophets that was pointing to me, he's there to actually fulfill. It's not there to establish, this is how you gain admittance. It's pointing to someone who is going to grant you admittance or uh, Romans chapter 5, access by grace. That's the big picture, church. I think we tend to, if we don't have that big picture, we get lost and, we, and culture is able, our pre, cultural preferences or traditional preferences have room to edge things out. You, we've got to keep the big picture of what God creates in his image to establish his rule on earth, have dominion over all of that together in diversity, in this diverse, beautiful um, expression. And you get all the way to the end in Revelation and gathered around the throne worshiping many tribes and tongues. It's not because, well, I, it just didn't work out that way, so now we've got many tribes and tongues. I would have liked it if everybody was just white and spoke English. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God's vision of a diverse household to his glory and for our thriving. It doesn't feel like thriving. I look and I say, man, it doesn't look like, so we, we see more and more divide because we're not thriving. We're not thriving because we're not seeking the mission of God. We're seeking dominance over one another. So we're not thriving. But together, what a diverse expression for the flourishing of humanity. Like that's the mandate. That's the mission. And interestingly enough, God's still on it. Even though we're kind of like, hey, wandering around. Like he's still on it. And he's holding it. And at the end of all things, many tribes, many, tri many tongues, gathered in worship. Beautiful. So God sent his son to die in our place, thereby raising us to new life and seating us with Christ to reign and rule and to have dominion over all creation. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. It takes us all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. That's the big picture. So the question here in Acts 15 is one of admittance and, and, and these cultural preferences, um, these traditional preferences um, begin to edge out and get added to um, what is required for admittance or to gain admittance. That, that's the situation. And this is as far as we're going to get here. Let's said, look at this. Uh, in verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Okay, so that assumes what, whether these men from Judea are saying something that's true or not. <laughs> because the, when, when these men from Judea came up and they started communicating, you've got to be circumcised according to the law of Moses, uh, Paul and Barnabas are like, uh-uh, no. And they're going to debate them on the subject. And this debate is not small. Just for emphasis. <laughs> In case you were wondering, it's like, well, in my opinion, it's not really that way. No, no, no. No small debate. They went toe to toe. Why? Because this is the difference between the gospel and not. There are other things, a lot of room for us to have grace for one another. Your preferences over my preferences or vice versa that aren't essential things that we need to have a lot of grace and liberty for and not add to what is required for admittance. There's a lot of room, but they're going to go toe to toe if you're going to start talking about how one gains admittance. You're talking about essential things. This is what the church ought contend for, that the list is small of what's required for admittance. And we've got to fight and, and go toe to toe and have ourselves no small debates. And there's a place to contend. But so often, well, maybe let me say it conversely. So rarely do we contend in the right place. More often than not, oh, we can contend. You just, just scroll Facebook for just, just about five minutes. We can contend. But rarely are we contending for right things. Circumcision was a part of the old covenant which Christ said he fulfilled so is no longer required. And these men were adding to the requirements for admittance and this is the nature of religion 
Religion says this, you broke it, you fix it. So you screwed up, so what are you gonna do to fix that? So get your life back together, start doing these things, stop doing those things, and then you'll be good. Okay, that's religion. So religion has lots of lists. Do these things and you can gain admittance. The irony about it is as you do these things, which should increase your confidence that you'll be good. You look at the list, I've checked them all off, I should be good. But ironically, what happens when we have long lists is we're almost pretty sure we haven't done it. Did I miss anything? What if I didn't do that? I got to be baptized again. I got to be, all these things we start, the, uh, the irony of religion is it doesn't actually increase confidence in, in my salvation. It increases concern because we're not good with lists. And we begin to worry. So religion says, you can do it, try harder. And the gospel says, no, you can't do it. You're dead. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. You can't do it. You're dead. But Jesus can believe. Okay. There's a f that is no little difference. It is a massive difference. Just huge, huge, huge canyons in between. Not even remotely the same. I'm going to read uh, this to you from Hughes. And uh, he offers such great imagery. I really enjoy reading him. You remember his imagery of the guy crawling out over the ice and then the guy with the, with the carriage driving. Okay, same, same author, same book. He just is rich uh, illustrations and metaphors. And so I want to share this one with you. Imagine that an airplane flies over the South Atlantic and crashes a thousand miles from any coast. In the plane, there are three individuals, a great Olympic swimmer, an average swimmer, and someone who can't swim at all. The Olympic star calls out, follow me, I'll get you out of this, and takes off with an impressive crawl heading for the tip of South America, a thousand miles away. The other two jump after him. In about 30 seconds, the non-swimmer goes down. It takes about 30 minutes for the average swimmer to be deep sixed, but the champion swimmer churns away for 25 hours, covering an impressive 50 miles. See where this is going? Terrific. Only 475 more hours to go. He'll be there in 19 days if he doesn't slow down. You see the point? where religion would, would put, pit us against one another in comparison. What kind of a swimmer are you? And if you feel like you're the Olympic swimmer and you, look, and you can make it for whatever it was, the, the 25 hours or whatever, 50 miles or whatever it was, good for you. You're still a long way off. You're gonna drown just later. Okay, that, that levels the playing field. Nobody's getting there. Nobody can swim for 20 days. It's beyond all of us. And religion puts the onus on you and your ability to swim. And the gospel says, you ain't making that. I don't care how good of a swimmer you think you are, you're not making that. And you need someone who can make that. And that person is Christ. You see the difference of what it does in, in, compar in the comparison game? Because in religion, we then start looking out at each other. And guess what ensues? Ah, interesting. Supremacy over one another and dominance over one another is we try to outdo. Rather than recognizing, you need Jesus. I need Jesus. I don't care how far you think you can swim. I don't know. I don't care how far I can swim. We're not going to make it. Every single one of us in this room right now needs Jesus. And desperately, like the difference between life and death kind of need Jesus. I'm with you. You're with me like we're in this together. You see the difference. It's glorious. And so often the church has contributed to, historically even, you look back at just horrific movements done in and through the church, which are just another example of cultural dominance. So the question then is, how do we gain admittance? By works of the law or by grace? 
I pretty much already preached the sermon. See what I just did there? Now we're going to go to Ephesians 2. We'll just pick up right where we left off last week at verse 8. If you're just joining us online or here this morning, we've been working our way through this letter that Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus. And so he's engaging them and just glorious glorious biblical truth is he is unpacking what the gospel is and then subsequently what it's not. And that's the work he's doing here, and it's, 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 it's wonderful. So verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, which, let me point out, is assumed by the definition of the word grace. So there's a lot of repetition here for the sake of clarity. Grace is a gift or an unmerited gift. Like, you didn't deserve it. It was given to you. So for him to say you are, when when he says, for by grace you have been saved, you don't deserve it. It was given to you. And then to say, this is not of your own doing, it's to repeat himself. Because not of your own doing is assumed by the word grace. See that? Okay. He's not done repeating himself, by the way. He wants to make sure this is clear. And, and let me say this. Um, we miss on this point so often as a people. I am thankful for Paul's repetition and clarity. This is not a hard passage to understand. But how often do we just end up landing on a religion based on our own doing? I try to imagine if it wasn't plain. Where would we be if it wasn't plain? If already, even while it's plain, we have a tendency to focus and depend upon our own doing. Goodness, I praise God for this section of Scripture. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. He's repeating himself again. It's a gift of God. This is about admittance. By what means does one enter? And enter what? Well, this is a positional reality. We talked about it last week. Over and over in Ephesians, we talk about the position of being in Christ. So when you are saved, when you receive by faith, he says, by grace, through faith, when you receive by faith what Jesus has done for you, you are transferred from one position to another position. This position is outside of Christ. This position is in Christ. So it's a positional reality. It goes back to what we were talking about last week. You were dead, now you're alive. You were in the kingdom of darkness, now you're in the kingdom of the beloved son. You were this type of glory, now you've been transferred to another. You've been made into a new kind, a different kind of glory. Transferred from one position to the next, one kingdom to the next. So how do you get transferred? What, how are you admitted into that other kingdom? By your own doing or is it a gift of God? And that's, that's the question and Paul plainly answers it. It is a gift of God. Your admittance is grace. You have nothing. You can't swim. You can't do it. Sure, you might make it 25 hours. Some of you may be... 30 hours, maybe some of you just about five hours. It doesn't matter. You're not getting to South America or whatever he said. You're, it's a thousand miles away. Like none of us are getting there. And it has a way of just sort of leveling the field. And Jesus died for his people and that's all of us. And I think there was a tendency, and this happens in the church still today, but when you look at it, it's almost as if the Jews saw sort of two ways to be saved. And we see that with religion. And people who feel really religious can look out at people and go, yeah, they need the grace of God. If they're going to get in, they're going to need Jesus, okay? I'm good because I've done the things required. So I'm good to go and praise God for Jesus because he's allowing them to come too. That's sweet. Okay. That then becomes two different ways to gain admittance, one by your own doing and one by grace. And it is not a recognition of the gospel to celebrate those two ways. You do not understand the nature of grace, even while you go, oh, that's great. But there's, what do you you have suddenly? You see that? 
don't you have supremacy again? Aren't we back fighting for dominance over one another? It's so insidious. Okay, that's the mission of God twisted. Things, our sin complexly broke things. Okay? And we have this gravity to slip into what is not the gospel at all. That's why Paul and Barnabas are going to have no small debate. And that's why we need to be very, very intentional about these things and preach them in firmly. Otherwise, how we walk out what we believe the gospel is will either look like what Jesus intended for his kingdom or not. You miss a little here, you're going to miss a lot down there. It's just the way it works. And so we have to be intentional. And, and again, as plain as Paul is here, we gain admittance, all of us, every single one. There is one good news. There is one gospel. There is one way to be saved, and that is Jesus. And you need him like I need him. And you don't need him more than me. I don't need him more than you. You don't need him less. Like, we need him because none of us are swimming that far. That's the idea. He's going to repeat himself again, true to form, not a result of works. So again, it's a gift of God, not a result of works. Well, he already said that. But he's going to say, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, what is boasting? You guys see, you see a rhythm here. What's boasting? Isn't it, ah, oh, gaining an edge and having supremacy over one another rather than together in oneness, um, sort of having dominion over all the earth. You see that? So again, our sights so quickly get set on each other instead of together as God's diverse people establishing his rule for the good of, of, of all humankind. So there's a couple reasons here in the text of why admittance is not by works. The first is, we looked at last week, you're dead, and dead people can't do anything. So there is no amount of doing a dead person can do to be alive again. So that's the, he's already made that point, and we looked at that at length last week. The second reason is, is new, so that no one may boast. Jockeying for position, out swimming one another, and thinking that's good. It's just not. You might feel good. This is morbid, but you might feel good about yourself as you feel like you've got a lot of energy while you watch the guy who doesn't know how to swim take his last breath and die. You might go, man, I feel pretty good. I've like, I, I got good energy. I've got a lot of life still in me right now. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. What? Feeling good compared to what? The guy who just drowned? You get to, you're feeling good because you, you outdid the guy that drowned. Well, you're going to drown too tomorrow. You're going to drown too tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And then look at verse 10. And again, when you would talk about big picture, you start seeing it all come together. And guys, the, the harmony in Scripture is beautiful. It isn't like the Old Testament is one message and the New Testament's another message. It's like the, the continuity and the fulfillment and the glory is so amazing. But look at this. This verse seems like it's just out of nowhere. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk into them. So Paul is saying, look it, I know I'm just saying it's not by our own doing that we are saved, but that's not to discount works. So remember we talked about, I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago, the, the proclaimed gospel or the charismatic gospel, the gospel that is told of what Jesus has done for us and proclaimed. There's that gospel, but then, then there's the gospel the, that's on the ground, so to speak, as Chandler puts it, where we, we, it's got feet and it lives among and it works. Works for what? Works for human flourishing and establishing the reign and rule of God over all creation whereby we thrive and he gets glory, that kind of work. Remember when God put Adam in the garden? He, it says explicitly in Genesis 2, he says, God put Adam in the garden to work it. So work predated the fall. So there was, there was something that God had intended for man to be about and put him in the garden to do that. To what? To 
be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, to subdue all creation, to have dominance over, establish his rule on all the world, that God was going to reign over all humankind, over all the earth, in and through his representative, which is man. And we totally blew it. So then Jesus comes as the second Adam, Romans chapter 5, and he succeeds where Adam fails. And what does he do? He establishes the reign and rule of God on this earth, goes and is seated at the right hand of God. We then come to Christ by faith, by grace. We are buried and raised with him, seated with him to what? To reign and rule over all. You see it? I mean, I know I'm repeating myself, but he does it. I want you to see it. You were created. You are a workmanship of God for work. So in Christ, by grace, he's not just redeeming his workers. He's redeeming the work. It's awesome. We're back in the garden. So good, church. We were given the work before we needed saving. And then needing saving, it wasn't like God said, okay, fine, forget the work. Now I just need to focus on how to get you guys to South America. <sighs> no. We need saved, but I still want you to do the work. So I'm going to redeem you and then put you back to work. And that's the church. That's the church. Yes, proclaiming the gospel, but yes, putting feet to it, working together, not at each other to gain supremacy over one another, but accepting our diversity and our different gifts, thankfully, because I don't know how I would do this if you weren't here. Or man, I don't know how I would accomplish this if you weren't here. I don't know how to do that. You do. Get over here. It's that kind of thing. And then together, arms link, we march forward and establish the kingdom. It's awesome. That's why we give of our money. That's why we serve with our gifts and our talents and our time. It's why we foster and adopt children. That's why we mentor through Be Undivided. That's why we fight for justice. It's so unfortunate that the word justice is getting a bad report today. Do you know what the word means? And now we turn down our nose. Anybody wants to talk about justice? Oh my God. <laughs> is God concerned with justice? Is he concerned for and in advocacy for the oppressed? Absolutely. So we fight for justice. That's why we help the poor and visit the sick. That's why we serve in our schools. And the list goes on and on and on. It is God's people reigning with him to establish his kingdom to subdue the earth and fill it turn to Romans 8 and we'll be done If you're familiar with the, the argument in Romans, which is just uh, remarkable, uh, then you understand how um, climactic Romans chapter 8 is. <laughs> because by, when you're back in Romans chapter 1 going, dang, I'm in trouble. Like you read chapter 1, there's no, you, there's no imagining that there's going to be a Romans chapter 8. You're reading chapter one and you're like, man, I'm, I'm done for. So right out of the gate, he takes a shot at the Gentiles and said, you guys are sinners and you have no excuse. And the Jews are like, yeah. So chapter two, he goes, Jews, you guys are sinners, you have no excuse. And they're like, man. Again, it levels the playing field. There's none of this, I can swim further than you kind of stuff. You all need Jesus. You all need him. So chapter one and two, it's just like a one-two shot. It's like bam to the Gentiles and whack to the Jews. It's like we're all in trouble. Then by chapter three, you're getting into this. Look, there is no one who does good, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
all of you, not some of you. Some of you need grace. The rest of us can do it by our own doing. No, there's none of that. None of you seek God. None of you do good. Everyone falls short. You're all a mess. (laughs) It's just getting better and better. And then as he establishes that truth, what he does at first in the first few chapters is he just knocks out whatever footing you have underneath you that was not built on Christ. So all that sand, you know, build your house on the rock, not the sand. All that sand you piled up underneath you makes you feel kind of good about yourself. He's just like, first three chapters of Romans, he's kicking all that sand out. And everybody's standing nose to nose now going, hey, what happened to the, the th- oh. So he, he deconstructs our religion first. And then he builds the gospel brick by brick. And by the time you get to Romans 8, you are like, are you kidding me? That is a significant turn from Romans chapter 1. So let's read. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How did we get there from Romans 1? I, I, I don't know if it's possible to overstate uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. I don't know if it's possible. His choice of words could not be more emphatic, which is true to form for Paul anyway, but in the Greek... It's interesting, word order for us. We, th- we think, you know, therefore, it's going to be based on everything that he wrote before, and we, we, we kind of start with that, therefore. That's the transitional word in English. Well, that's not the first word in Greek. In Greek, word order speaks to emphasis. And the first word that Paul uses is the word no. That's the loudest word in this sentence. No. Therefore comes later. And so in the Greek, there is an emphasis that's sort of lost in the way that we do language. So it could could more literally be translated like this. No possible condemnation is there, therefore, for those who are in Christ Jesus. It could not be stated more emphatically. There is no possible way that one who is in Christ will be condemned. No possible way. And you're like, man, I just read Romans 1. And then two, and then three. Well, did you read four? No. Well, that's where I started to pull the plate and started to lay the bricks. Of, I, oh, okay. And then five, did you get five? And then six about being dead to sin? No, dead to sin, not dead in sin anymore. What? What was, I missed that part. And then yes, chapter seven, where we still wrestle in the flesh, but the, even as we wrestle in the flesh, Romans eight, there is no possible condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is grace that we receive by faith. You want to talk about admittance? That's what's required. Period. Period. And all because of what Jesus has done. Here's the basis, verse 2. For the law. So here's the justification of that emphatic sentence. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. So that is similar to the theme in Ephesians. In Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned it in Christ. So what the law couldn't do, God did, is basically what that sentence says. And so I've often illustrated it like this. It's like the law was never intended to save you. It was never a path to Christ. It was something to give you that God gave us to show us we needed Christ. That's why they made the sacrifices all the time. So I I liken it to a tape measure. It's like a tape measure can show you how how far something is off. Because if you need something eight feet, Well, then, it's not quite there. But it can do nothing to get anything to this. So it just shows you that you need Jesus. But it can't save you. It can't make a short 
a short two by four longer. It can't make a long two by four shorter. It can just show you. This is the mark. What do you need to measure? Do you need to measure that? Nope. Oh, that over there? Nope. Anybody else? Romans 5 says that God gave us the law to increase the trespass. What does that mean? It means that by giving us the law, we, we become aware that I'm a bigger sinner than I thought. Yep. No. I thought I could swim better than that. Nope. You made it four hours. Good for you. <laughs> okay. And the basis of that no condemnation is Jesus stepped into our place and swam a thousand miles for us. And by faith, we made it. And by being in him, positionally in him, guess what? You made it. And he's going to reign perfectly at the right hand of the Father and establish his rule and reign over all creation and subdue the earth as human representation of God's glory. Oh, interesting. But then by faith, where are we seated? With him. Doing what God told us to do in the very beginning. That he restores not just us. He restores the work he gave us. He gives it back to us. In Christ, positionally. It's glorious. It is glorious. There is a distortion that often creeps up in the church. These men in Acts 15 did the same thing. It's like, if you want to be pleasing to God, you, you better do something pleasing. That's the way one of my professors put it. I cannot be pleasing to God unless I do something pleasing. That is religion. And what Kent Hughes calls a folk religion, which I love that phrasing. I'll put this on the screen. The truth is, and he's referring to his swimmer analogy. So this is the very next paragraph. The truth is, despite our popular folk religion, our paddling will never do. No matter how good we are, the distance is too far and we are too flawed. We can try, but all our works will be no more beneficial than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. That's not the first time I've heard that. The Bible says, not a result of works, and that is the truth. It's a gift received by by faith. And faith is, is more than just belief. James writes, even the enemy, even the demons believe, and they're terrified, so they believe in Jesus. So it's more than belief. It's active. It's not passive. It's, it's this belief, as Hughes puts it, belief plus trust. It's I believe you, Jesus, and I trust you. I trust you're going to make it to 1,000 miles. I trust that what you said is true and that I am going to be saved and I will have what I need to gain admittance. So it's belief plus trust in what Jesus has done. And that's admittance into the kingdom. And we don't just sit around and wait for Jesus to come back. We got work to do, church. We got work to do. And we miss the scope of the mission of God. I think the church gets kind of bored because they're just waiting for Jesus to come back and arguing over what, form, what stance of the end times is right. And we're just going to spend the rest of our lives doing that. Well, great. Where do we get to work? Making disciples of all nations. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you, Jesus said. Genesis 1 and 2 mandate, being walked out, lived out by the church, restored and renewed by Christ himself on the cross in our place for our sin. Guys, I'm calling you to that. So those of you who know and love Jesus, that's the work. Where, where are you giving of your money? Where are you giving of your time and talents? Where are you serving? Where are you engaged in the work? Because I guarantee you, our church is less effective by your lack of contribution. I'm not just talking about finance. I'm talking about the gifts you have that I don't have. Like, I'm not good at this. And someone is like, um, I am. I could never get on the platform and do what you just did. But dang, I can kill this. I'm like, good, because that scares me to death. Oh, 
So God gifts us diversely for the building up of the body. It's like there's a verse. Yeah, that's what he does. And we contribute. We're different. And we contribute with what we have. Financially, time, resources, talents, all of these things for the expansion of the mission of God. Sounds kind of fun. Certainly something I would give my life to. Some of the folk religion stuff, I think I'm tired of it. I don't have a lot of motivation for it anymore. And I'm going to start having some no small debates. Okay, let's stand again. Thank you.